You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. I'm excited that my beautiful wife is is back home with me today. She's been gone for two weeks handling her business in terms of young life. And it's just good. She came back this uh, very early this morning. And I'm just happy she's uh, she's she's here. Amen. But we're going to read from the word of God in Revelations 2, 12 through 17. Let's let's read together to the angel of the church in Pergamum. write: These are the words of him who has the sharp double edged sword. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word for the edification of our souls. Amen. I want you to turn to somebody and say, keep it 100. Turn to somebody else and say, keep it 100. Yeah. Amen. Let, let some, let some of your ghetto background come out a little bit. You know, that's what you wanted to say anyway. You didn't like when I said, keep it 100. Yo, man, you got to keep that 100. Got to keep that 100. And when you hear that phrase, uh, most of us know and understand that that means that you, it's, it's about keeping it real, keeping it true. And in this instance, it's, it's even a little bit more than that. It's keeping it pure. Amen. And so, so Jesus is concerned here at, at, at the church at, at, at Pergamum with purity. That's the, that's the overarching principle that 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 he is emphasizing as you know in Ephesus it was about love in in Smyrna it was about suffering amen and here we are in Pergamum and it is about purity and so last week we 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 were able to 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 look at um Jesus in terms of that that person as he reveals himself, it was, we know we have a pattern here in terms of uh, the lessons from these seven churches. And and Jesus uh, reveals himself in terms of the person. There's an emphasis on his activity. Amen. Because he says he is the one who has the what? Uh, who has the sharp double-edged sword. And again, having a sharp double-edged sword is talking about the activity that he is able to accomplish within the church based upon the word of God. The word of God, the scripture says in Hebrews 4 and 12, is living and active, amen, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul from spirit, joint from marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so Jesus is really emphasizing his activity. In particular, uh, Pergamum was one of the few cities that had what they called the just glad eye, which in, in the Roman Empire meant they had the opportunity to decide capital cases. And so what Jesus is telling them is even though you think you have the just glad eye, you really don't. I'm the one who actually has the just glad eye. I'm the one with the sharp double edged sword and I don't bring it from the side. I bring it from my mouth. And so it's interesting in Pergamum and we, and we talked about it, 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 it last week that, that he really, Jesus really says, you, you do a good job on a few things. I see that you're steadfast and that you're faithful. And that really has everything to do with, with them being able to be unified when it comes to outside of the camp, meaning that, that, that they, they, they put on a, not, and I'm not, they don't front. I'm saying they, they, they put a good defense together when you're talking about things happening outside of the camp. They come together well. He says, you remain, you remain true to my name. And I know, I know where you live. I know Satan has his throne there. I know there's emperor worship and I know it's, it's tough times and tough activities and you do a pretty good job in terms of, 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 of having a defense against those things that you see coming at you from outside the camp. But I have this against you. He said just a few things. I have this. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the what? Teaching of the Nicolaitans. And so what you begin to understand and pick up is that 
that doctrine is being compromised. And when we can compromise the way you view scripture, when you can be compromised in terms of the way you view God, eventually your activities and your actions will be corrupted. And so that's not happening necessarily as an attack outside of the camp. That's something that bubbles up from inside the camp. You recall and know, and I've said it many times, that the devil deals in 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 four ways. Basically, is doubt and deception, and discouragement and discord. He he's always those are those are the tools he keeps in his toolbox all the time. But 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 doubt and deception, uh, discouragement and discord. Deception again has everything to do with trying to provide false teaching. Because if I can control, if I can influence your mind, eventually I will influence your actions and your activities. As soon as you begin to think differently about what God has said then you'll start on a track that will lead you to make decisions that are independent from God instead of dependent on God. That's what we well know the serpent did in the Garden of Eden. He simply said, did God really say? Isn't that, is that what he said? But you saw a beautiful pattern, and we talked about this in Bible study yesterday. You see a beautiful pattern in Scripture where, where, where God where God talks about at the end of every day that he did creation. He said, and, and he looked upon what he had done, and he declared that it was what? It was good. He said, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. And then you get to chapter 2, and then God, for the first time, says something is not good. He told Adam what? It's not good for man to be alone. So therefore, I will make him a help suitable for him. Adam had a choice right there. Amen. It's the choice that you have every day when you talk about what God has revealed. Do you believe what God says? Do you believe God is the diviner and discerner and the determiner of what is good? Amen. He said this is good and this is Not good. And if you don't believe what God says about what's good, then you cannot receive what God says. Amen. Adam had to believe that it wasn't good for him to be alone to him for him to be able to receive the gift that God had given him, which was this beautiful mate that when he opened his eyes, he said, this is now flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. I will call her woman because she came out of man. But Adam could have literally said what you and I say a lot of times when the truth of God is revealed. We say this. I'm good. If you don't want something that somebody has offered you, you simply say, I'm, I'm good. I don't need that. I got this. I'm good. But but, but God is saying to you, I, I determine what's good and what's not good. And if you don't receive what God says as good or not good, then you begin to make your own determination about good. And every time we do that, it turns out to be a complete and utter catastrophe. Every single time. Just one chapter away from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3, we see utter catastrophe. And catastrophe happens in your life and in my life all the time. And so again, false doctrine is, 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 is a way for Satan to, to, uh, get into your mind and get, get you to think differently about what God has said. And then you begin to rationalize instead of just receiving the truth, as we've said many times, you and I will reject the truth of God, then we will rethink the truth of God, then we will replace the truth of God. When we rethink it, it becomes philosophy. When we replace it, it becomes religion. And the scripture says in Romans that the wrath of God is being revealed unto those that suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's the danger of what's happening here in Pergamum. And he goes on. He says, you realize, he said, that there are people that hold to the teachings of of Balaam. Balaam was the prophet, as we talked about last time. Balaam was the prophet that got the Israelites, that, that, that Balak had hired to curse the Israelites. But God would not allow them to be cursed. He said, they can't be cursed. He simply said, why? Because they're blessed. They have relationship with me. They're blessed. You can't curse them. And the teaching of Balaam is this. Balaam's like, I still need to get paid. 
He said, so I do have another idea. And it's simply encased in this sentence. What you cannot curse, you can corrupt. If I can't get God to move away from them, I can't get them to move away from God. And so when he had a, there was a showdown, come on somebody, above the campground when it was between Balaam and God. God won that showdown. But then after the showdown above the campground, there was, beloved, a letdown in the campground. And then people lost their lives. 24,000 folks lost their lives because of a plague. Again, because they went with this teaching of Balaam. And Balaam simply said, which you cannot Curse you can corrupt. And he got the folks to get involved in some sexual immorality and some other things with the, the Moabite women and mess their whole program up. Because he realized if you can propagate, uh, promulgate, excuse me, false doctrine, you are well on your way to getting the people to move away from God. And so... He says, likewise, you have those that hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And as we said the last time, we don't know exactly what those teachings were, but we know that, again, there was there was some kind of way where the Nicolaitans were really talking about uh, compromise. And you're living in a in a world and in a corrupt and fallen world and in a city that has emperor worship and all of those other kind of things. There there had to be some part of what they were teaching was you can find a way to compromise yourself and still be able to maintain all of these things you can be out in the world and you can be in the church at the same time that's the essence of false doctrine but 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 it starts with the thought it starts with the ability to be able to say no i know what god said that 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 i can't serve god and money i know what he says that i can't sit at the table at the lord's table and the table of demons i know what the word of god says i know what the pure and unadulterated uncut word of god says but but i don't like that outcome and i know what he said is good but but i want to determine what's good i'm good and I think that I should still find a way to be able to, to move about in the world of Pergamum in such a way that I don't hurt myself and I, and I, and I, and I, and I compromise a little bit, but I think I can make it all kind of hold together. See, that's, that, that's, that's false thinking. That's false doctrine. And so this is what Jesus says. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will come to you and will fight against them With the sword of my mouth. He's basically saying, if you can't fix this, I will. You better recognize I I, I will come. And what will I come with? The sword from my mouth. So what is the fix? Jesus is saying the fix is going to come with the what? Word of God, because in the church, in this church and in many churches that we have right now today, comfort equals compromise. As I've told you before, we want to make sure that when people come to church, that they are comfortable in absolutely every area but one. We want you to be comfortable, put on comfortable shoes. That's fine. Put on comfortable clothes. We want to have a comfortable temperature. We want, we want you to be able to, 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 I'm sorry, Ma. I know it's cold in here. Um, we, we, but that's what we're striving for anyway. Uh, it, that, that, that everyone is comfortable. And I know that's not possible with the temperature, but, but I digress. But we want you to be comfortable. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to come back. If, if we could set it up and there's churches that come to, that you come to where they say, if you're not ready to come into the sanctuary yet. We'll, we'll set you up in the fellowship hall so you can kind of view it on a screen and, and we'll, and you can read the paper and you can have a cafe latte and you can sit there. We just want you to be comfortable. And that's still church. It's okay. It's not church though if you're comfortable with your sins. That's the one place that you cannot be comfortable. I don't want you to be comfortable if you and I are doing things that are diametrically opposed to what God has revealed as true, what God has revealed as good. You and I should be terribly uncomfortable with that because if if we don't have if we're comfortable then we will not change. And that is that prescription really comes with the uh, word of God. 
and, and, and so I, I want to encourage you around that. And, and, and in a really, in some real broad strokes, if you looked at second Timothy chapters two, chapter three, and chapter four, there is in, in, in some very large steps. There, there, there's something that is happening there as, as Paul, as Paul talks to him that has everything to do with truth. And I just, I just want to remind you of that. And you, and you may say to yourself after you say, Pastor, have you talked about this before? Yes. Pastor, will you talk about this again? Yes. Pastor, why do you, why do you, you you keep talking about it? First of all, don't ask me those kind of questions. I'm talking about it because it needs to be talked about. And why? Because here is the goal. The goal is for me to talk about it enough for at one point for you to be able to write it down. And if you've already written it down good to remind you about it and it will really curl all the way over when there becomes an opportunity in your life to share God's truth with somebody else. Because we're talking about making disciples. And so if it takes more conversations around that for you to understand the, the promotion of truth and the, the, and the power of truth and the presentation of truth. Second Timothy two, second Timothy three, second Timothy four. If it takes that for you to be able to share that with somebody else. And so somebody else can, can understand the promotion of truth. And then somebody else from second Timothy three can understand the power of truth. And somebody else from second Timothy four can understand the presentation of truth and understand some of those things that we've talked about. Yes, that is the point. Because the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder, soul from spirit, joint from marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And when you're talking about false doctrine and when you're talking about impure thoughts, the only thing that cuts through and clarifies like nothing else is the word of God. So much so we could co-opt in our sanctified but culturally influenced minds. The song from Parliament that would say this, make my word the pure word. I want to get filled up. Make my word the pure word. Don't want my word stepped on. I want the bomb. I want the pure word. I want my word uncut make my word the pure word before i take it home y'all hear what i said make my word the pure word because i wants to get filled up make my word the pure word don't want my word stepped on i want the bomb i want the pure word i want my word uncut make my word the pure word before i take it home that's how you keep it 100 you do it with the word of god it needs to be pure it needs to be uncut it needs to be unstepped on and if you do that it will divide asunder soul from spirit joint from marrow Discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And in Second Timothy 2, and we're not going to get in it to any great detail, but just those, these last, these last verses that, that, that are so familiar to us in, ver- in verses 23 through 26, and it really has everything to do with the promotion of truth. How do you, when I say promotion, is it how do you engage with the world around truth? It says this, for foolish and unlearned questions avoid, for they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patience, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil which are taken captive by them at his will it says when you are promoting the truth of god you have to remember the end goal is two things repentance and recovery and when you when you're talking about people that that need to hear what the savior has said you 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 don't share the word to beat people up amen you don't share the word to judge he says you have to be gentle and apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that literally you understand they're opposing themselves they're walking around in darkness you're trying to show them the light and they need to repent and they need to recover and when you're promoting truth if you keep that in mind that's how you engage with the folks around you and then 
you, you know from verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3, not just the promotion of truth. Now you have an understanding a little bit about the power of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is what? Profitable for rebuke, excuse me, for doctrine, for reproof, for rebuke, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished. Perfect, excuse me, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know that the word of God is profitable. Amen. He says, if you send it out, if you do what you're supposed to do, the word of God will do what it's supposed to do. It's profitable and for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, for correct, for instruction in righteousness that somebody may be yielded perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In the words of of, of Ray Charles, you got the right one, baby. This is it. This is it. There is no other. You, if you, if you are a promoter of the word of God, understand there's a power to the word of God. And then in chapter four, Paul tells Timothy, look, boy, preach the word. Now, I know he might not have said it like that, but that's how I hear it. Boy, you better preach the word. Be instant. In season. No, not, not out of season. No, you better be instant. You better be on it. Whenever the occasion arises, be instant. In season and out of season. Amen? Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long, long suffering and doctrine. You preach it and you preach it right. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He said, boy, you better rightly divide that thing. You better have it not just in your head. You better have it in your heart. It better be right there. So when you when you need it, you're instant with it. You got to be nice with yours. You got to be surgical. I'm surgical with this here, Jake. I'm surgical. I got to be surgical with this here word. I got my 66. I'm surgical with it. Be instant, in season, out of season, whether they want to hear you or not. Because the scripture says the time will arrive when people will not endure sound doctrine. And they will heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears. What does itching ears mean? It means that we will only listen to those that can tickle our ears. If you're not telling me what I want to hear, I don't want to be at your church. And if you come to this church and then you decide to leave because I'm not preaching what you want to hear, but I am preaching the pure, uncut, bomb word of God, if you got to roll, roll out. Because there's only one thing that we will do here if we don't do anything else that keeps it real and keeps it 100 and keeps it keeps it church is if you preach from the word of God, you will make people uncomfortable. And the question is just after that, what you going to do? Not what are you going to do? What you going to do? What you going to do? Yeah, I came up your street. Yeah, I stopped at your house. The word of God did. I didn't do it. Don't look at me. I'm just his humble servant. But I'm nice with mine. And he's told me to tell you this or tell you that. And when the word of God cuts, what are you going to do? Are you going to look at the surgeon that that cut you and say, you shouldn't have cut me? Or are you going to look at him and say, thank you, because now you've discovered something that I need to get rid of or something I need to change, something I need to fix, something that needs to be corrected. You did your job. And Jesus says, if you don't do your job in Pergamum, I'll do it. I'll come with the sword that's proceeding out of my mouth. I will cut joint from marrow, soul from spirit, because that's what the word of God does. And literally, I am the word of God. The living word. And that's why 2 Timothy 4, when it talks about preaching the word, being productive and being prepared, being precise, being patient, being principled. That's, that has everything to do with the presentation of truth. And so he says, repent therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And so the problem was compromised through false teaching. Amen. That's the subtlety of deception. If everybody is comfortable with where they are in your church, then, then you're not preaching. You can't be because the word of God is designed to make you uncomfortable and literally also 
believe it or not, and I know you do, it makes me uncomfortable. That's the part about having a two-edged sword. You got to watch that. While you're trying to cut one way, you'll get cut the other way. And you know how many times I've been cut handling this word? All the time. It's like, watch out. That's Wait, wait a minute. Hold on. That's going to come around and cut you too. Yeah, it does. Because as much as I'm shepherd, I'm still sheep. And there's some folks that if you don't understand that or you don't recognize that you're shepherd and sheep, you, 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 you think you're in a different position, but the word of God cuts. Amen. And, and, and it cuts. And the promise is if, if you can turn it around, the prescription is repent and recover. It's, it's kind of the same thing. Repent literally means the direction you're going, stop, stop, turn around, come back. It's a full stop and it's a turnaround. 180 degrees. Amen. 180 degrees. Just stop. Turn around. Don't take the circuitous route here or there. Just stop. Turn around. And come back. This And as you come back, you will recover what you've lost. He says, so that's the prescription. Repent and recover. And he says, here, here, here's the promise. And, and, and to those who overcome, I will give, I will give some of the hidden manna. Hmm. Hmm. Some of the hidden man. I also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known to him only that receives it. What? 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 Pastor, what's what? what what's up with that hidden man? Well, well. Let, let, let me let me tell you this. In Exodus chapter sixteen, they talk about the manna, and 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 the Lord told them. So in verse 33 of Exodus 16, Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put a omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to keep for generations to come. And so in the Ark of the Covenant that they used to carry around, they had the Ten Commandments. They had a omer of this manna and they had the staff that Aaron's staff that budded. That's what they used to keep in that in the Ark of the Covenant. That's the manna I'm saying that is the hidden manna. And also, then you could also look to John chapter 6 when Jesus talks about him being the bread of life that's come down from heaven. Bread of heaven sent down from glory that he says, I am, I'm, I'm the true manna. I'm, I'm the manna that the children of Israel, uh, uh needed to eat and, and should have been eating in, in the, in, in the, uh, in, in the wilderness. And so he's, he's the manna. He's the bread of life. But that hidden manna, and if you look at Exodus chapter 16, and I, and I have to tell you this, it, 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 it says the people of Israel called the bread manna. That's how God fed them daily. He, it would come on in the morning and he would tell them, get it bef- before the sun gets it and burns it up. So get it in the morning. Meet with God early in the morning. He's, and, and the scripture says it was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Now, so the fact that that, that Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you some of the hidden manna is important because the hidden manna is the manna as God intended to give it sweet like honey. But if you look at numbers chapter 11, we, we see a totally different situation, unfortunately, with the children of Israel. And the reason I have to mention it to you is because it ties so closely to the the carna- it's a, it's really a path to carnality. It's a path to compromise. This is, this is how you compromise and you end up messing up what God has intended for you to do. He gives us one thing and then we change it around and do something else with it. And that's what the essence of false doctrine is. And so again, for, for Jesus to say, I'll give you some of the hidden manna and I'll give you this, this white stone and, and, and uh, a stone painted white oftentimes, man, it was like an invitation. I'll give you a, a invitation, uh, to something. And this name that 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 he, he says something about a, a name that that nobody knows but you. That could be the name that he has that he reveals in Revelation three seventeen that no man knows. Or it could be a situation where he's saying because of your new nature and you're going to be pure, I'm going to change your name like I did Abraham's name. I changed it to I, I mean from um, Abram to Abraham like I turned changed Simon's name to Peter like I changed Jacob's name which meant deceiver and beguiler and I and I changed his name to Israel which means he who struggles with God, he who wrestles with God, because when I change your nature, uh, I, I want to change your name because I don't want you to be known by that name anymore. And that's what that means. But I want to focus a little bit on that hidden manner. Why? Because if you look in Numbers chapter 11, it says when the people complain 
And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them. And the people cried out to Moses and prayed and said, The Lord was uh, unto the Lord, and his fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Teborah. And the mixed multitude, come on somebody, that was with them, that was among them, the scripture says in the King James, fell a lusting. They, they, they fell off. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? This manna? <sighs> yeah, okay. Every day, that's, that's what you got for us. But who will give us? Well, we remember. This is, this is the part that's terrible. This is really, really terrible. But it's so much like us, it's, it's not even funny. So much like us. They said, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the, and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. That's what you remember. Cucumbers, onions, leeks. That's what you remember. You don't remember brick pits. No? You don't remember mud. You don't remember bricks without straw. You don't remember the lash of the overseer. That would be like black people talking about, let's go back to slavery. Remember how much fun we had? We'd sit around and, and Fiddler would get on the, uh, on the fiddle and, and we would dance around and it was just great. Those Sunday night worship services we would have and we would sing, oh my Lord, 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 Lord. It was great. Mm -hmm. And we had all of that fat back and hog maws and we had chitlins and pig ears and everything that Massa didn't want. And we, girl, you know how we used to change that stuff, right? It was so good. That's how ridiculous it is for the children of Israel to be reflecting back on a time in Egypt where they were enslaved to be talking about the fact that, that, that they had food and they're complaining about the food. See, that's what happens when you start complaining. You complain and then you crave uh, uh, other things that are based upon your association with this mixed multitude. Then you start to confuse your past. How many times have you looked back on your past life before Christ or some other things that you did and you, you reflect on them in such a way that, that they becomes your glorious past? Your sinful past becomes your glorious past. And God is looking at you like, really? That's, that was the prime of your life, right? In college, when you were drunk every night and you were hanging out and smoking weed, that was, that was good, right? Those are, the, those are your best times. Those are your good times. Now, you, you about to remember some other things that were happening in your life, all of the confusion and all of the other things, the distance that you had from me, you better understand. And now they said our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. And the manna was a corner seed, and the color was the color of belladium. And the people went about, this is what I wanted to get to, gathered it, ground it up in meals, beat it in a mortar, baked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. Listen, the worst thing that they did in this whole passage to me is they not only cut their desire for what God provided, they created a substitute they could stomach. He gave them the manna, pure and uncut. It tasted like honey. By the time they finished frying it and putting hot sauce, salt, and pepper on it, all it tasted like was fresh oil. That's not what God intended. And you and I do that kind of thing to God and God's word and God's provision. We change what God does so that we can stomach it instead of taking it pure and uncut from the start. And you and I know, and we've said this before, black people, we will eat absolutely anything if it's fried hard enough with hot sauce, salt and pepper. That, therefore, everything that we eat tastes like what? Hot sauce, salt, and pepper. Okay, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you keep... You ever heard of lasagna? Yeah. You ever heard of black lasagna? What's black lasagna? Black lasagna is the lasagna without the ricotta cheese because we don't really like ricotta cheese that much. And so we substitute the ricotta cheese for... I don't know, cheddar cheese, American cheese, some other kind of cheese. That's what we do. So we can taste it. We can be like, we want it to taste. Then it's called, it's, it's the black lasagna. And sometimes you can go over somebody's house and they be like, oh, no, 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 that's not, no, that's no, it's just black lasagna. Oh, okay, cool. 
And I still put hot sauce, salt, and pepper on it anyway. And, 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 and so again, when Jesus says, I'll give you some of the hidden manna, the manna that we put that in, in the Ark of the Covenant, the manna that tastes sweet, manna the way I intended it, not the way you changed it, not the way you ground it up, not the way you changed it so that you fried it, not the way you changed it so that it tastes like oil instead of honey. It's what I was giving you. It's what I desired for you. I want you to have what I have for you. Uncut. Not stepped on. I want you to be pure, Pergamum. And that's the principle that we emphasize at the church at Pergamum. He says, listen, church, I need you to be pure. I need you to keep it 100. Not 85, not 95. That's, that's you're getting there, but I need you to keep it 100. It's so important. And in order to keep it 100, you have to have the pure uncut unstepped on word of God that's what keeps us right that's the biblical standard the final authority in our lives as believers has always it has to be the word of God no matter what happens in culture the final authority in our lives is the word of God the savior of our lives is the son of God and the kingdom that we must prioritize uh, the citizenship that we must prioritize is in the kingdom of God that never changes no matter what's happening at 1600 Pennsylvania, no matter what happens in Helsinki, no what hap happens on Capitol Hill, no matter what happens, those three things don't change. The final authority in our lives is the word of God. The savior of our lives is the son of God. And the citizenship that we must prioritize is in the kingdom of God. Culture will always be at odds with that. It always has and it always will. If we will never line up with them. If we got to keep it 100. And those things will help us to keep it 100 if we remember the son of God, the king kingdom of God and the word of God. Keep it 100 today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. We ask that you would be with us, Father. We thank you for these reminders in Pergamum around purity, Father, that we have an appreciation, Father, for what you are trying to do in our lives, Father, that, that you want to give us that hidden manna. You don't want us to take the manna and then cut it and change it and because we're craving other food and we want something that tastes like something else we want to take what you've given us and and take it pure and respond and believe what you have said about uh truth and what you've revealed father and simply receive it not re not rethink it not reject it not rethink it not replace it but just receive it father help us to understand that the word of god is powerful there's a power in the truth of the word of god that you've given us instruction and 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 guidance around how uh, about the promotion of truth and and helped us to understand the endowment of the power of truth and you've even given us uh, uh some instructions around the presentation of truth father help us to preach the word and be instant in season and out of season and more and more in this culture, we will be out of season, out of flow, out of step, but we still have to live the same life, a life of submission to the truth of the word of God. So help us, Father, to do that. In the name of Jesus, we pray.